Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar Invertebrate Management with Dr Lizzie Lowe, which has been organised by Perth NRM and Regen WA. This event is supported by the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation through their Soilwise program and through Lottery West. My name is Jess and I'm the program assistant for the Sustainable Agriculture team at Perth NRM. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we are all meeting from today and pay our respects to the cultural elders of the past, present and emerging and acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. We are very pleased to have Dr Lizzie Lowe from Edith Cow Cowan University joining us today. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please pop them into the Q&A box down the bottom and I will call them out at the end of the presentation. There will be time at the end for more questions as well. I will now give you a brief introduction to Lizzie. So Dr Lizzie Lowe specialises in invertebrate management with an interest in, concert, in conserving biodiversity in human modifi modified systems, such as farms and cities. For the last three years, Lizzie has been working in agriculture extension, helping farmers to sustainably manage pests. Recently, Lizzie has moved back to Perth after 10 years living over east and is excited to be starting a new role as a research fellow at ECU where she will be investigating the impacts of natural resource management on urban invertebrates and their ecosystem services. I will now pass over to Lizzie to begin her presentation. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jess, and thank you for the invitation from NRM Perth to speak today. It's always a pleasure to talk to people about bugs. Um, I have been passionate about invertebrates ever since I could remember, um, especially spiders and, and kind of predatory insects. And I decided to kind of launch my career into thinking about the way that we could basically have as many good bugs in our systems as possible. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today, trying to increase the number of insects and the good insects that we have in our ecosystems. Um, so to give you an idea of my background and kind of where I've been to get me to here today, um, I started off in Perth at the University of Western Australia studying honeybees um, and then I moved to Sydney to do my PhD and I studied spiders in Sydney. I did a short postdoc at the University of Auckland studying beetles which was hard work, Beetle, never study beetles, there's way too many species of them uh, and then I moved back to Sydney again and went to Macquarie University for four years as a postdoc. I also started up a small environmental education business called Living City Science, um, and then I started my role at CESA Australia as an extension scientist. And this was a bit of a shift for me. That's when I moved into looking at agriculture and the way that we can um, improve sustainable pest management in farms. Uh, I also run a program for Invertebrates Australia, which is a NGO focused on conservation of all invertebrates. Um, and they're doing some really fantastic initiatives across Australia. And most recently, I have left uh, my position at CESA to take up a senior lectureship at Edith Cowan University. And this has given me an opportunity to really launch myself back into the research world. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about where my research is heading next. Uh, but the main things I'm going to be talking to you about today are the importance of having invertebrate biodiversity, of having lots of insects in the ecosystems we live and work in the way that we can be moving towards sustainable pest management and kind of what pest, pest management looks like at the moment and working with different stakeholders to improve practice because there are lots of stakeholders involved with um, invertebrate management uh, and a lot of kind of details that need to be worked out in order to move towards more sustainable practices. So I work both in urban areas and agricultural. There are a lot of similarities in these two systems in that they're highly modified systems, that they're kind of geared towards human needs rather than environmental needs, but also that uh, invertebrates play really important roles in both of these ecosystems. And that's what I'm particularly interested in. So you might've heard of the term ecosystem services, which is about something natural that gives that provides something important to people. Um, and when it comes to insects, there are a huge suite of really, really important ecosystem services that they provide. So you'd be really familiar with something like pollination. Everybody knows that we need bees in order to pollinate some, some crops um, and that they're really important for our food supply systems. Um, but there are also other things like decomposition is a really important one. So there are lots of invertebrates in the soil uh, which will break down organic matter so that the nutrients can go back into the soil. Um, dung burial is another one. That's one that people don't often think of. But if you don't have insects that are taking dung from systems like, um, like pasture systems uh, and meat production systems, um, then they become very messy very quickly. So these are really important parts of those systems. 
Um, seed dispersal is an interesting one. In Australia, we've actually got lots of different species of trees which have evolved this relationship with ants in where the seeds that they produce have a tasty little treat on the end of them specifically designed for ants. Um, the ants will come and grab that seed, they'll take it back to their hive, sometimes, you know, hundreds of metres away, bury it down into their colony, and then um, the tree grows up away from the parent tree. So this is a really symbiotic relationship. Uh, invertebrates are also a very important source of food for a whole range of birds, mammals and reptiles. You think about this in the context of losing invertebrate biodiversity, we're going to have a whole lot of food webs that basically fall apart if we lose a lot of invertebrates from our systems. I really strongly believe that invertebrates are very important for education as well. I Biodiversity conservation is all focused on humans valuing what they have. They have to understand the importance of things and they have to want to save it. Um, and I don't think people can understand that without actually seeing it themselves, without having that connection with nature. And I think invertebrates, they're right outside your back door. You can, you can study them in your back garden. And so I think invertebrates are a really nice way for children and adults to engage with nature to, and to understand how important it is. Um, I've popped medicine and materials in there just because there's some really exciting research coming out at the moment looking at things like um, spider venom for curing cancer and for creating new biopesticides um, and particular chemicals and self-cleaning glass made from beetle, um, beetle, beetle exoskeleton um, kind of uh, information and the technology that they build from these invertebrates. So I think that's super cool. Uh, and finally, pest control. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. The real advantage of having these spiders and predatory insects in our systems, they've been evolving to eat bugs for millions of years, basically. They're very good at it, and we should be relying on them a little bit more to do this job. So we kind of group uh, insects that do important jobs into this kind of overall term of beneficial insects. Um, but of course, there's not just benefits that we get from invertebrates. There's lots of what we would call, I guess, an ecosystem disservices as well. So this is things like disease vectors, so cockroaches or mosquitoes that can spread disease, especially in urban areas, plant damage in agricultural areas. You know, it's one of the largest kind of things that will affect crops is when you have insects come through and, and eat the product uh, and property damage from things like termites. So invertebrate management is complex because you have to kind of um, – weigh the um, importance of, pr of protecting biodiversity with this um, also need to control these pest species. And also pests are not always pests. They're sometimes a particular species will only be a pest under some circumstances and other times it's completely okay. So there's a lot of balance to be worked out. Now, why should we care about pest control in this context? Why is it the thing that I've kind of decided to focus my career on? Um, Firstly, it is because of these ecosystem services, so we know how important they are for the function of ecosystems. And the reality is that in a lot of environments across the world, uh, invertebrate biodiversity is in decline and we're actually at risk of, of losing this function because of it. Pest management, as it is at the moment, is actually one of the biggest drivers of these declines. So the use of chemicals instead of um, uh, using non-chemical means to control pests. And as I said before, it's fascinating because there are so many different stakeholders in pest management and many of them probably need a bit more support in order to do um, these kind of practices much more sustainably. I was part of this large paper a couple of years ago, which was looking at a roadmap for insect conservation and recovery. And one of the main things that came out of this was these no regret solution. It's basically something that has benefits no matter what if you do this. Um, and one of them was phasing out pesticide use and replaced with ecological methods. So for me, this was a real kind of um, a real point to pin on and say this is something that we can do right now to actually improve the conservation of insects. And one of the reasons for this is that there are a huge number of impacts from the use of insecticides um, across urban and agricultural systems. In the centre here, I've got biodiversity loss, which affects people's health, the economy, and the environment. But there are other things like the exposure to the chemicals that are used, the impacts on non-target species. So you might be spraying a chemical for cockroaches, but you might also be affecting bees in your garden. There's this idea of um, secondary pest outbreaks. So often in farming systems, you'll spray at one time of the year, it will kill off the pest you were targeting, but then there's kind of a niche where a new pest can come up and then you actually have to deal with that one as well. So you've really got an ecosystem that's completely out of balance then. Um, and also incorrectly, 
incorrectly applying pesticides is going to cost you because of the cost of the chemicals. Um, and also things like bioaccumulation. So that's when you spray a pesticide and the um, the birds or the reptiles will come on and eat an insect that's been affected and then it will poison them as well. So there's a lot of reasons that we should be thinking about limiting the use of insecticides. And if we think back to um, our ecosystem services and the effect of biodiversity loss, it means if we have a huge amount of insecticides used in these systems, we're going to be limiting all of these ecosystem services. And I think that's a really, really important thing to, to keep into consideration about what we're losing when we use these chemicals. So I mentioned before that it's all about balance. Um, you need to be able to control pests, but you also need to be able to control diversity. And the reason for this is that di the diversity, so the number of different species you have in these systems, gives you an idea of how functional it will be. So, you know, all of, how many of these services are going to be able to be happening. And if you lose these, then you actually have to increase the inputs and you have to increase the management you have in these systems. So two examples I've got here are um, the loss of honeybees in some countries uh, means that they actually have to come in and pollinate their crops by hand now. Can you imagine? Like that's a huge um, cost and a huge labour cost as well for, for having to do that because you've lost honeybees. Um, and also when we think about decomposition, if you've got a really healthy soil biota, you've got invertebrates in that system that are taking that nutrients and putting it back into the soil. If you lose those through the use of insecticides, you actually have to put more inputs into the soil to make sure you've got the nitrogen and the, all of the nutrients that you need there. So less invertebrates in the end could mean more management rather than less. So let's talk about what, in, what invertebrate management currently looks like. In urban areas, it's not great. We rely on chemicals for a lot of our invertebrate management, and there's not a lot of regulation around what kind of chemicals can be used either. Um, management can either be done by private, um, by you know people, residents in their own back garden. They can go and buy chemicals and use them, uh, or by practitioners. And practitioners are a real mixed bag. There are some of these um, pest control um, guys who've gotten into the industry because they love bugs. They've always wanted to work with bugs. They understand them really well, and they've made a really good career out of um, kind of working with people to understand their insects to manage them. But there's also a group of practitioners who've kind of they've learned a trade, which is um, it's this is a very quick trade to learn. They kind of do two weeks of training. They know which chemicals they're allowed to use, and they just go out and they use those chemicals. And they've used this as an opportunity to build up a business. And so their main interest there is getting as many clients as possible and basically spraying as much as possible. So it's a difficult um, situation here in where the interest of these businesses are. Um, but we do end up seeing in urban areas a lot of excessive and unnecessary use of pesticides. I always use this picture here to illustrate that because this is here advertising pest control services, but the vast majority of insects they're actually displaying there in that circle are not pests. So this, um, the one that looks like a fly down the bottom, that's a hoverfly. They're beneficial insects both as juveniles where they're predators and as adults where they're pollinators. The one in the middle is a centipede, which is a really useful predator. I think that's a mayfly in there, which is not going to hurt anyone. Cockroaches, you know, definitely can be a pest, but not in all circumstances. There's a lot of native cockroaches in Australia, which are decomposers. Um, crickets, I'm not sure well, how they would ever be a problem, except maybe eating some plants in your garden. Beetles are definitely um, beneficial insects, a lot of them. Uh, they both can be predators and decomposers. And the spider there isn't going to cause anybody any problems, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So I think it's just, it's about understanding what is a pest and when it actually needs to be controlled. The thing that really interests me about insecticide use in urban areas is that there's been some research done in the US that in urban gardens, they actually use more pesticides than they do in their agricultural systems. And for me, this, this really blows my mind because I understand farmers using insecticides. They Sometimes they have to. They have no choice. They, if they don't, they lose their crop, they lose their livelihood. I get that. But in urban gardens, I think a lot of this use is, um, it's almost just um, about the look of the garden. You know, they might find that they have a couple of leaves of their lettuce being eaten or they've got some bugs on their citrus trees. It's not a life or death situation. It's really just about the aesthetics of their garden. And I think that's about a reframing about what people should expect in their gardens. They, another study found a very high use of insecticides in public housing in the US. 100% uh, of houses had a whole lot of different pesticide residues from their kitchen, from a sweep from their kitchen floor, which which worries me. Um, and basically, Australians are spending a lot of money on insecticides. And we have access to a lot of products as well. 
um, don't know how much you know about the different chemicals, but things like fipronil and neonicotinoids are broad spectrum insecticides. Neonicotinoids have been banned across Europe and most of um, America because of the impact that they have on um, beneficial insects like honeybees, whereas we can still buy them from Bunnings and Woolworths. So this is a real concern. It also means that people can buy these products and use them however they like in their gardens. Um, so there's very little regulation about the way these chemicals are used. If we think about how invertebrates are managed in agricultural systems, there is higher regulation in what can be used and when, but there is some still off-label use uh, and the regulations are very open in Australia. We have that farmers have a lot of access to a lot of different chemicals that other um, countries like Europe and the US don't anymore. Um, and there are a lot of broad spectrum insecticides that are still widely available and widely used. There is a high prevalence of prophylactic use. So this would be before the crop goes in the ground, they'll do a spray to get rid of all the insects just in case for their establishment phrase. And again, I understand why farmers feel like they need to do this because if they they feel like if they don't then a, an aphid could come in and wipe out their entire crop when it's only this far of the ground i do understand that but there are other methods that they can be using to avoid having to spray at that time um and i think that there is a significant problem with the kind of conflict of interest with the agricultural agrochemical companies and the influence that they have on farmers. Most farmers rely on um, the advice of their agronomists, and these agronomists are amazing. They're highly trained. They're, 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 I think they have one of the most complex jobs in the world, to be honest, because they really need to understand the whole farming system. But a lot of them end up kind of getting, all these companies get their money from the sale of chemicals. Um, and so for me, that means that the their advice is always going to be geared towards understanding which chemicals are the best way to manage pests rather than understanding the full suite of um, different methods they could be using. So what does sustainable pest management look like? One of the things that's really important about sustainable pest management is knowing what exists in your system. So knowing what kind of beneficial insects are there to do to kind of help you with these jobs, uh, what the risk of different pests are, which pests um, exist in your area, and what kind of risk there might be for these pests at different time of the year. Because if you know this, it means you can prepare to mitigate these risks. So if you know that your area always has problem with cabbage white butterfly or something like that each year, then you can understand the biology of this pest and you can go, okay, these are the host crops that it's surviving on over summer. I'm gonna get rid of them so I don't have a problem next year. It's just understanding a bit about these pests. Um, and this is an example of using non-chemical preventative measures. So really getting on top of understanding where the pests are coming from and stopping them before they even become a problem. You, it's also really important to monitor pests and beneficials, both in urban and agricultural areas, to know what's there, to know whether um, numbers are increasing, um, because there are many circumstances in which you may have a small number of pests, but it's not actually until they start building up that they become a problem and you don't need to spray them when they're at low numbers. Um, I, it's always important to use control methods with the least impact first. I'll talk about that in a second, um, but also only using chemicals if you need to. So only using them if they get above what we call a threshold. A threshold is a number of pests past which point they're going to cause economic damage to your crop. Um, but the problem is we don't have a lot of thresholds for a lot of different pests. They're very, very hard to develop. They take a lot of research and sometimes it's almost impossible to know this. And they're pretty much non-existent in urban areas. We don't know how many pests are um, a problem in urban areas or whether you, know, whether you can have three mosquitoes and not have a risk of Ross River virus or whether you have 700 of them. So we're lacking data there. And I think the final point here is just always using selective chemicals if you need a chemical rather than broad spectrum. Broad spectrum chemicals will basically kill any, any invertebrate. That's the way that they're designed. They attack um, parts of invertebrates that um, that works across any species. Um, whereas there are a lot of better chemicals that have been designed now to only um, target a smaller number of pest species. And when we bring all of these ideas together, this is um, all comes together in an idea called integrated pest management. And this kind of strategy was developed for agriculture in a way to, to switch up 
the way that we think about pest management. And the idea is to kind of start with the least toxic things. So at the bottom of the pyramid, the things that we can just do in our environment um, to prevent pests from, from increasing. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then we can start thinking about some other things we can change. We can start bringing in um, beneficial insects to control some of these pests. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. If all these things don't work, then we can start thinking about selective chemicals and just targeting that pest. And if that still doesn't work, then you can move to the broad spectrum chemicals. So integrated pest management is not about not using pesticides altogether. It's just about only using them when you really have to. Um, and this kind of um, structure does give lots of options for when chemical management might not be possible. Insecticide resistance is a really big problem in Australia and it's becoming more of a problem in agricultural areas and in urban areas. Uh, this is when a particular type of pest or a population of pests have been sprayed with the same chemical multiple times. One or two of them survive each spray because they've got a, a genetic immunity to it. And then those ones that survive breed up and you end up breeding very, very quickly a whole population of insects that are completely resistant to these chemicals. Um, and, and that's obviously a problem. Um, but the thing about integrated pest management is, as I said before, you do actually have to understand these pests. You have to understand the beneficials, what they're feeding on, what time of year they're going to be there. And that takes a lot of um, effort and a lot of knowledge. And we don't really know how to do this properly in cities. So if you think about one of the things I talked about there, it was about biological control, which is using natural enemies to suppress the pests. And we're talking, these are all kind of examples of pests, uh, sorry, of um, beneficial insects and spiders that exist in our systems already. They're already there, ready to do these jobs. So we've got spiders, lace wings are these beautiful ones here with the, um, the green lacy wings. Ants are really good predators as well. A lot of ants in systems, praying mantises, wasps, um, different types of wasps can either be predators or something called a parasitoid, which will lay its egg in the pests, um, which ends up killing the pest. Ladybirds are amazing biological control agents. There are predatory mites, which can control agricultural pest mites and different types of spiders. So we can have both generalists and predators um, and specialists. Uh, specialists will only attack one type of pest. Generalists will eat all sorts of things. And it means that you need to use fewer chemicals if you've got these insects in your system doing these jobs. But it does rely on having healthy, balanced ecosystems. And I'll just give you a little snapshot here of some of the research I did while I was over in Sydney. I was curious about whether we could be relying on beneficial control to manage pests in urban areas. And so one of the things I did was went out and I surveyed a whole lot of people's back gardens and urban reserves and, um, and parks to look at how many species of spider were there. And I found over 144 species kind of just in the Sydney area that are all there basically, you know, controlling pests and, and doing these really important jobs in urban areas. And this is just spiders and not even taking into account all the other um, beneficial insects that are out there. Um, so I think we underestimate how uh, important the biodiversity in urban areas is and also how diverse it is. I was blown away by how many species we have in our urban areas. And I think it's, it's a nice thing to consider that we've got this option. Okay, so if we're going to rethink the way that we do invertebrate management, what are the kind of things we need to do? The first thing, especially in urban areas, is to understand who's using the chemicals, why are people spraying uh, and what are they using? Because if we can understand this, then we can help them move away from using um, pesticides unnecessarily. It's important to develop and offer sustainable alternatives, to be, so to be talking more about IPM and the way we can use it, to engage with practitioners and to improve their training. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I've been doing in this area, both in agricultural areas and in urban areas, and to talk to residents and farmers and to improve the information that they have access to. Because if they're only things that they're seeing are advertising from chemical companies, then that's what they're going to use. So the stakeholders involved in invertebrate pest management are very varied. We talked about um, farmers, but all land managers basically have a stake in pest management. Local government and landowners also um, need to be thinking about what kind of um, methods they use, as well as residents. Gardeners are some of the worst um, people for using lots of insecticides on their lawns and things if they want it to look perfect. Um, the contractors and practitioners who are doing these pest control um, sprays, business owners um, and schools and community groups. And I think um, businesses also kind of get forgotten sometimes because 
you know, we talked about thresholds before and how many pests you need to have in order for it to be a problem. If you're thinking about restaurants and food providers and things like that, their thresholds are incredibly low. You know, they get called up by the um, public health authorities if they have one or two cockroaches. So for them, doing sustainable pest management is really, really difficult because they can't afford to have any insects within their within their businesses, even beneficial ones. You know, some of these times if they find yeah, a beneficial wasp in their restaurant, um, nobody's going to care if that's beneficial or not. It's still, they still get called up. And I think that's really problematic. And I think that's very difficult for businesses um, when that's kind of the expectation that's upon them. So we talked about understanding residential insecticide use. One of the things I did while I was in Sydney is just put a big survey out there asking people how they felt about insects in their houses, how they dealt with um, insect pests and why they used insecticides. And one of the questions was this, why do you use them? Um, and the top kind of answer that came back was, I'm worried about insect bites and stings. I don't like having insects and spiders in and around my house. And I'm worried about damage to plants in my garden. And um, for me, this is quite interesting because it kind of identifies that there's a bit of a um, misunderstanding about insects and spiders in general and how much damage they're likely to cause. Because there are very, very few insects and spiders that will actually bite or sting you out of the whole suite of biodiversity that's out there. Um, and and also damage to plants in the garden. I, I do understand why people wouldn't want to have their veggie patches completely decimated. But if they do have a couple of leaves that are eaten or a couple of pieces of fruit that are have a tiny little bite out of them, um, I think that we kind of need to re- um, identify our priorities here as far as whether it's actually okay to have a couple of bites out of an apple versus spraying our entire garden with a broad spectrum insecticide. This is For me, this is kind of interesting to understand where these drivers are. So we found that over 80, so 83 percent of people are using insecticides in their home, not even just in their garden. So that's quite high. Um, but when I asked them what would make them stop doing this, um, they said if it made the problem worse, you know, fair enough if it harmed their family, if it harmed their pets, or if it harmed wildlife. They were kind of the top things that would make people stop using insecticides. Um, and for me, this is really kind of an educational problem because insecticide resistance is a big deal in cities. Using these chemicals is actually likely to make the problem worse in the long run. So maybe if people understood that, they might spray in their houses a little less often. And harm to family and pets, you know, it's actually could be much healthier to not use these chemicals than to use them. Um, and harming wildlife, we've got reasonably good evidence now that a lot of the chemicals that we're using are harming the wildlife in their urban areas. And so if we get people to understand this, then they're much more likely to rethink the way that they manage pests in their houses. So people want the low health impact, they want the low environmental impact, but they might not understand the risk of the spraying that they're currently doing. So this is a really a public health message. And this was an interesting one to me. This was talking about... Um, whether the public would be interested in kind of alternatives methods of pest control. Um, this is a, an interesting study that came up from Canada, I think, and they were asking residents whether they would pay for biological control in the urban landscapes. They had a particular street tree that was being attacked by a beetle, I think, um, which, you know, is kind of relevant to what we're going through in Perth at the moment as well. And if we looked at the support for these different options, the release of a parasitoid wasp, which is kind of one of these guys here, which would control the beetle, had a very high level of support. It was above 70%. Um, and the support for spraying uh, was much lower. And the support for saying, no, I definitely don't want spraying was quite high. So for me, this says people do want biological control options. They would much prefer most of them to use these biological options than to use chemicals. Um, and as part of my survey, the things that people really wanted out of their pest um, control was that it, for it to be targeted, uh, to have a low environmental impact and low toxicity. So this is exactly what integrated pest management is. People want to use integrated pest management, but we don't always have the products and services available for them to use. Now, in agriculture, it's obviously a little bit more complicated because there are very specific pests that need managing and there are very specific times across the season when they can be used. Um, but one of the um, resources that's recently been developed to help support farmers in making good decisions was um, this table here called the beneficial toxicity table. And it basically looked at a whole lot of beneficial insects from ladybirds to hoverflies to spiders and predatory mites. And it looked at how 
um, much, a whole lot of different chemicals affected them. So if they sprayed them, you know, could they survive that chemical or were they all killed off instantly? And this means that when farmers are deciding which chemicals to use and wanting to promote beneficials, they can come to this table and they can look at the first half here and go, OK, if I spray these chemicals here, I know I've got a reasonably good chance of keeping my my um, populations of these beneficial insects here. Whereas if I go down the bottom of this table here, if I have to spray these ones, these are broad spectrum insecticides, I'm going to kill off most of my beneficial insects. And so it helps them to be able to choose chemicals which are going to be less um, toxic to their environment. So I think this is really important. Another thing that's really supporting the sustainability of um, agricultural pest control is the use of beneficial insects on a commercial scale. So there are companies now that will breed up things like ladybirds and wasps and you can release them on the farm. Bugs for Bugs is a fantastic one. There's lots and lots of products available for different pests. Um, and there's also a lot of technology like this one here where there's, you know, you can send up a drone with a whole lot of beneficial insects in there to release across crops. Um, so this can be done on a broad scale as well. And I think this is really a really exciting development um, in agricultural pest management. And there's so much potential there. So we also talked about the need to improve um, agronomist training and kind of awareness of integrated pest management. And something that I was involved with while I was working at CESAR Australia was the development of um, courses and resources for agronomists to tell them about beneficial insects and when they can be used. Um, an example of this is the Ag Pest website, but there's also a service called Pest Facts Southeastern, which is all about um, telling you about integrated pest management, uh, what you can do for different pests and at what time of the year. We also had some online courses, um, which I think is really, it's something that we need to see much more of. So something that farmers can, or agronomists can just jump on, do a 15 minute course, and then kind of think about it while they're out doing their practice and apply it in their own farms. And I think uh, I'd love to see more of this kind of work done as well. If we think about engaging practitioners in urban areas, these are the pest controllers I was talking about, um, and they really don't get a huge amount of training uh, at, for this for this career they kind of they have a two-week course and then that's it and they they kind of stick with what they know there's no ongoing uh learning um opportunities or kind of expectations for them when they have that role um so what i have been working on doing is supporting them to understand what clients are looking for because as i said before clients want integrated pest management and there's not many companies that will offer that to them at the moment so helping them understand it's actually a good business case in order to to um to give sustainable alternatives um and also to provide opportunities for up upskilling so it would be great to see more courses out there for pest control practitioners to use integrated pest management to use beneficial insects in urban areas and um, to understand how integrated pest management will work I led a, a workshop while I was in Sydney about the future of sustainable urban pest management. Um, and this was an amazing uh, kind of opportunity because we brought together uh, academics, local government council, um, uh, the EPA and pest control practitioners. And we sat in a room for a whole day and we talked about what pest management currently looks like. We talked about the constraints that are on practitioners and, and the services they provide. We talked about how local councils can support good pest management. And it was just really good for everyone to be in the same room to have these conversations. Um, and I'd love to be doing more of that kind of thing in Western Australia as well. I think the very first step always has to be getting on a shared understanding uh, and, and just discussing what the problems are so we can start solving them together. The final thing I'm going to run through today is just talking about how we can engage residents and improve the information that we have access to um, because because there's a lot of um, I feel like insects and spiders just really have a bad rap and we we can be doing things about that. And I do think that a lot of the unnecessary pesticide use is driven by fear um, and lack of knowledge. I have lost count of the number of people that will come up and tell me they sprayed a whole can of insecticide on a spider in their house. And I I just can't help but think that all of that insecticide they're spraying is way, way more unhealthy to their families than having one spider, especially because most won't actually do you any harm. So if we think about this idea of the, the fear that we have around insects, when, when the general public think about insects, they think about kind of bites, stings, disease, they think about swarms and food damage, and they just have such a bad reputation. I found this statistic a while ago that 40% um, of phobias in the US are related to bugs or spiders. That's a huge percentage. 
I mean, you know, there's a lot to be scared of in this world, but bugs and spiders really, they they shouldn't be factoring in there. They're not something worth being scared about. And so this to me is just so strange. Um, the reality of it is that this, this paper here says, less than 0.5% of all spiders present any risk to humans at all. So that's not even the lethal ones, that's just any kind of medical risk. And so it's it's so disastrously low, it's just, it's it's not really an issue. And that's what the kind of the misconception of the public of what spiders can do and the actual reality of it for me is really funny. And I do think that a lot of this kind of um, fear in the public has come from the marketing that we're exposed to and misinformation coming from companies. You know, um, Louis the fly is something that we kind of were all brought up with about killing these pests in our houses. There's this thing of more smart, more safe, more teen, and we all know that. And so they're telling the telling you if you want to be smart and safe, then you use more teen, and that's that's how people feel about insecticides. Um, this one here always makes me sad. It says kill the bugs you see and kill the bugs you don't see. And the bugs you don't see, they're the ones providing all the ecosystem services. They're the ones that are doing these important jobs in our ecosystems, and we, we shouldn't be thinking about killing them at all. Uh, and this one down the bottom here, um, I think even those of you in the audience that aren't spider specialists will be able to tell me that that's not a huntsman spider, that's probably not a mouse spider, and there's no way that um, that one at the end is a red-headed mouse spider, that's a wolf spider. So this is from a very well-known pest management company, and they can't even identify the spiders properly on their website. So this just goes to show that the people that are managing these pests, um, these pests um, probably don't have enough information about what they're doing and they're quite happy just to go out there and spray anything. Um, so this is where the education is required. Uh, I know it's easy to blame the media, but I really do in this case as well. There's some of the stuff that comes out about spiders is absolutely atrocious. So I'm just going to run you through some of my favourite examples. Um, spider horror as Brit woman finds a huge arachnid and its babies in her bedroom. And some of the subtext there says she uh, revealed her horror after confusing a huge family of spiders for a ball of dust. Like the language here is fascinating. They're they're building up this this fear. Um, it's a daddy long legs. Like there's nothing to be scared about here. It's really it's such a non-issue. And this was a whole article. And then of course the comments. Don't even get me started on the comments. Um, this one here, teen 19 feared losing her leg after horrific spider bites turned into a gruesome abscess. Um, there was a retraction of this one later because it turns out she'd scraped her leg on a nail and basically had it had gotten infected. But of course, she'd seen a spider the day before, and so she attributed this awful thing that had happened to her to a spider. Um, this one here, again, it's a kind of one that makes me sad. It's this, um, the, the language here used huge spider rescued from Queensland floodwaters, but it said massive hairy spider. Um, it was too horrifying to be real. And it goes on and says something else about like um, horror and fascination, you know, and, like, and the kind of just the way that they talk about it. Uh, something from a horror movie is what they say. And for me, this is exactly the same situation that we had with the koalas escaping the fires. And when the koalas were um, kind of being rescued from these fires over east, it's a native species, it's an escaping a natural disaster, and the koalas get these front page um, pictures of them being fed water by passers-by, and everyone is horrified at what's happening to the, to the um, koalas. Whereas if it's a spider, trying to escape a natural disaster, then we want to kill it with fire. It just doesn't seem very fair. Um, this one here is just an example of how it could be so much better. So this was an opinion piece, um, the greatest trial a Sydney resident can face. She was talking about a huntsman that lived in her house and she was basically spent the whole article saying she can no longer live in her house because there's a huntsman there and oh the horror. But for me, like this could have been completely flipped on its head. If this had been an article, it could have said, what's the best housemate in the world? And it could have said, you know, I've got this new housemate, sits in the corner a lot of the time, cleans up after all of the mess, like it's, it gets rid of all the pests, um, doesn't pay much rent, but also doesn't take up much room. Like you can change this narrative about the way we talk about insects in our houses um, that makes people appreciate them rather than this one, which would make people go out and spray them straight away. And finally, this is just a silly one. Man tries to kill wolf spider with a blowtorch but sets apartment on fire. Like this is where people are at. They they completely misunderstand the importance of these spiders and um and the way that they should be dealing with them. And um, I'm gonna say blowtorches are probably not the best way. Um I was part of a, a study that looked at newspaper article, paper articles 
based on spiders across the world, and 47% of them contained errors of some type or another, and 43% were sensationalist articles um, that use these kind of language. So it's a problem across the world, um, and I do think it's a problem we should be dealing with. So a lot of the work that I've done over the last couple of years is about trying to change public attitudes towards um, insects and spiders. I think that the bees are a really good case study here because, you know, 20 years ago, people actually didn't care about bees and they would have tried to kill them in their gardens. Whereas now we know that we need honeybees for pollination. People are building bee hotels in their back gardens and everyone knows you need to save the bees. Even people that don't particularly like insects will know that bees are important. So I think we need to move past that and we need to start thinking, you know, save the spiders, save the mantids, save the slugs. Um, and we need to get this into the public consciousness as well. I've provided some great examples here of um, like uh, science communicators on Twitter who are doing a really good job. These two are both talking about amazing cockroaches. Um, I think talking to kids is really important. I always do my best to go to as many schools as possible because kids love bugs. And if you get kids enthusiastic about bugs, they will go home and they will tell mum and dad that they are not allowed to spray insecticides in their garden anymore. And that's that's the kind of pressure I want to be having on people. Um, companies like Bugs for Bugs, which I spoke about before, make these lovely kits that you can actually buy and release beneficial insects in your garden, which I love as well. And of course, initiatives like the NRM in Perth doing the gardening for wildlife. This is all such important work that's going towards people appreciating invertebrates in their back garden. So I'll just kind of leave you with this idea of what we value about nature. Um, is it we value a garden with no pest damage at all that's pristine, beautiful lawns, you know, apples with no spots on them? Uh, is that what's important to us? Or is it that we have an ecosystem that has lots of different species in it? We have, yeah, you know, we have a healthy soil that's kind of recycling the nutrients and we have our plants being pollinated. Um, and what is it that we value about these different things? And, and you know, is it possible to put a dollar value on this if we're thinking about kind of having to monetize biodiversity and the way that we are appreciating these systems? Is it is it even possible to put a value on these kind of things? So just to give you an idea about what I'll be focusing on for the next kind of three or so years, um, I'm really interested in the way that we manage land in Western Australia, the policies we have about biodiversity and the practices that we use in urban areas about increasing biodiversity and what they might do to, to invertebrates. So even things like um, revegetation programs, are they actually benefiting invertebrates or are we just seeing more plants in these systems? I'd love to see how the use of of pesticides and waterwise versions and things like this are uh, impacting in ecosystem services across Perth and looking at ways that we can improve the way we manage invertebrates. So if we know the particular practices like spraying pesticides are having a negative impact, what can we do to change them? And I'm also really spending a lot of time thinking about the way that different stakeholders value invertebrates and, un and our attitudes towards them and how this might influence the way that things like the nature repair market influence um, uh, which kind of efforts go towards different invertebrates. Uh, and through my work at Invertebrates Australia, I'm doing lots more public engagement about how important invertebrates are and how to reduce pesticides. We have a campaign that comes out towards the end of the year called No Spray Spring, where we encourage people not to spray in their houses and gardens. And we're looking at bringing out a backyard bug count to go along the back, along with the backyard bird count over the next couple of years. All of this work um, can't be done just by me. I think really it's really, really important that this is a collaboration amongst different organisations. I'm really all about creating links with uh, researchers, industry, government and the public and all these other stakeholders that are involved. Um, so if you're listening today and you're interested in these kind of things, um, please do get in touch with me because I'd love to work with you and do some more of this work in your area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. That was great. Um, I'm just going to see if anyone has any questions. If you do, please just pop them in the chat or the Q&A up the top. There's like a little question bubble. So, and then I'll read them out. Got a couple through. Um, is there a website where we can direct ag people to which shows the invertebrate versus the chemical table? Uh, yes, the, the invertebrate, uh, the um, toxicity table. Uh, it's on the AgPest website that I mentioned before. So it's just www.agpest.com, I think, or possibly .au, but you'll find it that way. Yeah. 
Awesome. Thank you. And any links with stuff like that we can send through with an email mm-hmm. yeah. at the end. So we're happy to send that one through. Um, mm-hmm. Someone else has asked if you um, – you mentioned that you did an all-day workshop in the Eastern States. Are you hoping to do one here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have funding for a one pest management workshop actually through Bupa. It gave us a little grant to do a pest management workshop in Western Australia. So that'll be coming out over the next oh, 12 months or so. And maybe I can work with NRM to do that kind of thing too. That would be a nice kind of collaboration to start up together. Um, so I'm sure that you'll you'll hear about that. Um, and I would definitely love to do more. I'd love to do a larger workshop like the one I did in Sydney that works with practitioners as well, because I think that there are a lot of opportunities for them, as it's like for them to build up their businesses and also for us to kind of change the way local councils talk about these kind of things. Um, so, yes, I'm hoping to have a lot more of these conversations over the next um, two or three years uh, in Western Australia. Awesome. Um, another question, are there more opportunities for buying the good bugs in the eastern states than here? Yeah, there are. So the main um, companies that I've worked with before are Bugs for Bugs and Biological Services. So both of them um, have operations over east. The limitations are that when you're going to release a beneficial insect in a crop, it needs to be a species which is already existing in that area. Otherwise, you can kind of um, end up with a cane toad situation or if you do introduce something it needs to be very very well studied to make sure that you can release it so the eastern states do have access to more species but a lot of them are present across australia and they will be able to ship the um, invertebrates from the eastern states over here uh, and biological services does actually have a an, an operations in western australia as well so there are there are definitely opportunities to buy bugs in wa as well Awesome. And then I've got another question um, from Jessica. She said that we are regenerative and organic broadacre farmers in WA. We are already chemical free, have built and protected native vegetation corridors for biodiversity and ab- absolutely love our bugs. Is this enough? And what else can we do to support our insects on our farm? I absolutely love that. Um, Yeah, and I didn't didn't even really talk about modifications to habitat to support beneficial insects, which is something else that I do a lot of. Um, And you're you're absolutely on to a fantastic start. Um, This idea of having native vegetation corridors within um, both urban and agricultural areas is is absolutely essential. So having as many kind of flowering plants and, and diversity in your vegetation area is actually the number one best thing that you can do because a lot of these beneficial insects are not predators for their whole life cycles. So things like lacewings, they might need pollen or um, uh, plant resources when they're adults and they might be predators when they're juveniles. So supplying everything that they need across that habitat um, is really important. As far as anything extra that you can do, if you're not spraying and you have the habitat there, you're really you're really onto most of the, the things that you can be doing. Um, the only other thing that I've seen kind of recently, the idea of is almost like transplanting some of these um, soil organisms and, um, and, and invertebrate um, ecosystems from other areas, kind of like a transplant. So if you found that you, you didn't think that the biodiversity was coming in on its own quick enough, there is an idea of kind of taking up some leaf litter and things from other areas and bringing it into your area to kind of supplement what's there. But I've got no evidence on whether it works or not. I just, I kind of like the idea, as long as it's, you know, not taken from a from a national park or anything like that. Great, thank you. Um, another question, what are your thoughts on the polyphagous shot hole borer, its impacts and treatment? Yeah, this is a really difficult one in Perth at the moment. So for people that don't know about it, it's um, it's a new introduced species and it's having a huge impact on street trees and private trees in the Perth area. Um, I think that the response in in Perth has been really impressive as far as how many people know about it and how much effort is being put towards um, kind of reducing its range. And I think the reason why that much effort has been put in is because it's one of the only options we've got is to kind of stop its range before it gets there. It's a very, very difficult pest to control, even if you do have access to chemicals, because it, you know, if it bores down into a tree, chemical treatment 
you know, you can't spray it. It's not actually going to work. Um, and as far as I know, there aren't actually a lot of integrated pest management um, solutions for that pest. So really like limiting the distribution is the best thing you can do, but also investing in research <laughs> so that, you know, when you do have pests like this that arise, you can have people out there ready to look for biological control options for pests like this. Um, the reality of the insect world is that for every insect there is, there's at least one you know, parasitoid that will come in and eat it and, and lots of predators for it. So the options are there. Um, sometimes it's a matter of um, having the resources to put towards understanding the biology of these pests in order to kind of bring those um, biological options um, to where they're needed. All right, I'll just check if there's any more. Um, Tim's asked, or it's also a bit of a suggestion, have you spoken to WALGA, W-A-L-G-A, to give a talk, a talk with them? Uh, I'm very new to this job. I literally started this week, um, so not yet, but I would absolutely love to. Um, there's lots of connections that I need to make with local government. Um, and actually, I've got a couple of small projects coming up at the moment looking at the way that we monitor biodiversity. Uh, especially invertebrate biodiversity with local councils, because I feel like a lot of them would love to know what kind of insects are in their area, but they just don't have the expect expertise to, in order to do that. Um, so yes, very high on my list of, of other presentations that I'd love to give as well. Awesome. Um, and then this wasn't really a question, but to see if you have any comments on it um, from Amy. Using pesticides on farm is very detrimental to the general health of the system. Anecdotal evidence that it is very hard to build soil carbon if using pesticides. Yeah, you have absolutely. I mean, carb carbon is definitely um, kind of one of the things that people are keeping a really strong eye on in urban areas. I mean, in, in agricultural areas at the moment, it's such an important thing. And if things like biodiversity credits come in, we're not just going to have carbon credits to pay attention to. We're going to have biodiversity credits as well, um, for better or for worse. And absolutely keeping these ecosystems healthy is going to benefit both of those things. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's all the questions. Um, just double check. Yeah. All righty. Thank you so much. Lizzie, thanks for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, it was a very insightful session on the benefits of encouraging natural diversity and the importance of invertebrates in our farming and natural systems. So thank you so much for sharing that with us and we hope to keep learning more about it because it's a very interesting topic. Um, thank you also, we just want to say thanks to the Perth NRM communications team who pulled this, helped pull this webinar together. Um, the webinar has been recorded today. Um, it will be uploaded to our website over the next week um, and we will also send it out to everyone that has attended today. So, yeah, thank you everyone for attending. I think that brings us to the end. Um, and have a good day. Thanks, Jess. Thanks. See you. Yeah.